Welcome to Classics You Slept Through. Today we'll be reading chapters 11 through 14 of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Chapter 11 For years, Dorian Gray could not free himself from the influence of this book. Or perhaps, it would be more accurate to say, he never sought to free himself from it. He procured from Paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition, and had them bound in different colors so they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed, at times, to have almost entirely lost control. The hero, our wonderful young Parisian, in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended, became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself. And indeed, the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life, written before he had lived it. In one point, he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero. He never knew, never indeed had any cause to know, that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and polished metal surfaces and still water which came upon the young Parisian so early in his life and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a bow that had once, apparently, been so remarkable. It was with an almost cruel joy, and perhaps in nearly every joy, as certainly in every pleasure, cruelty has its place, that he used to read the latter part of the book, with its really tragic, if somewhat overemphasized, account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and the world he had most dearly valued. For the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated Basil Hallward and so many others beside him seemed never to leave him. Even those who had heard the most evil things about him, and from time to time strange rumors about his mode of life crept through London and became the chatter of the clubs, they could not believe anything to his dishonor when they saw him. He had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world. Men who talked grossly became silent when Dorian Gray entered the room. But there was something in the purity of his face that rebuked him. His mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence that they had tarnished. They wondered how one so charming and graceful as he could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual. Often, and returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends, or thought they were so, he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room, open the door with the key that never left him now, and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that Basil Hallward had painted of him, looking now at the evil and aging face on the canvas, and now at the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass. The very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure. He grew more and more enamored of his own beauty, more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul. He would examine with minute care, and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight, the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy, sensual mouth wondering sometimes which were the more horrible, the signs of sin or the signs of age. He would place his white hands beside the coarse, bloated hands of the picture and smile. He mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs, and there were moments, indeed, at night, when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber or in the sordid room of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks which, under an assumed name and in disguise, it was his habit to frequent, he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul with a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish. But moments such as these were rare. That curiosity about life which Lord Henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with gratification. The more he knew, the more he desired to know. He had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them. Yet 
he was not really reckless, at any rate, in his relations to society. Once or twice every month during the winter, and on each Wednesday evening while the season lasted, he would throw open to the world his beautiful house and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art. His little dinners, in the settling of which Lord Henry always assisted him, were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited, as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table, with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths, an antique plate of gold and silver. Indeed, there were many, especially among the very young men, who saw, or fancied that they saw, in Dorian Gray the true realization of a type of which they had often dreamed in Eton or Oxford days, a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world. To them, he seemed to be in the company of those whom Dante describes as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty. Like Gautier, he was one for whom the visible world existed. And certainly, to him, life itself was the first and greatest of the arts, and for it all the other arts seemed to be but a preparation. Fashion, by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal, and dandyism, which, in its own way, is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty, had, of course, their fascination for him. His mode of dressing, and the particular styles that, from time to time, he affected, had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the Mayfair Balls and Pall Mall Club windows, who copied him in everything that he did, and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful, though to him only half-serious, fopperies. For, while he was but too ready to accept the position that was almost immediately offered to him on his coming of age, and found, indeed, a subtle pleasure in the thought that he might really become to the London of his own day what to imperial Neronian Rome the author of the Satyricon had once been. Yet, in his inmost heart, he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter elegantiarum, to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel, or the knotting of a necktie, or the conduct of a cane. He sought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles, and find in the spiritualizing of the senses its highest realization. The worship of the senses has often, and with much justice, been decried, men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves, and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence. But it appeared to Dorian Gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood, and that they had remained savage and animal, merely because the world had sought to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain, instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality, of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic. As he looked back upon man moving through history, he was haunted by a feeling of loss. So much had been surrendered, and to such little purpose, there had been mad, willful rejections, monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial, whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which, in their ignorance, they had sought to escape. Nature, in her wonderful irony, driving out the anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions. Yes, there was to be, as Lord Henry had prophesied, a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh, uncomely puritanism that is having, in our own day, its curious revival. It was to have its service of the intellect, certainly, yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience. Its aim, indeed, was to be experience itself, and not the fruits of experience, sweet or bitter as they might be, of the asceticism that deadens the senses, 
as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them. It was to know nothing. But it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment. There are a few of us who have not sometimes wakened before dawn, either after one of those dreamless nights that makes us almost enamored of death, or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy, when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself, an instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques, and that lends to Gothic art its enduring vitality. This art being, one might fancy, especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of Revere. Gradually, white fingers creep through the curtains, and they appear to tremble. In black, fantastic shapes, dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there. Outside, there's the stirring of birds among the leaves, or the sound of men going forth to their work, or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house, as though it feared to wake the sleepers, and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave. Veil after veil of thin, dusky gauze is lifted, and by degrees the forms and colors of things are restored to them, and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern. The wan mirrors get back their mimic life. Flameless tapers stand where we had left them, and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying, or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball, or the letter we had been afraid to read, or that we had read too often. Nothing seems to us changed. Out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known. We have to resume it where we had left off, and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits, or a wild longing it may be, that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that has been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure, a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colors and be changed, or have other secrets, a world in which the past would have little or no place, or survive at any rate, in no conscious form of obligation or regret, the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness, and the memories of pleasure their pain. It was the creation of such worlds as these that seemed to Dorian Gray to be the true object, or amongst the true objects, of life. And he searched for sensations that would be at once new and delightful, and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance, he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he knew to be really alien to his nature, abandon himself to their subtle influences, and then, having, as it were, caught their color and satisfied his intellectual curiosity, leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardor of temperament, and that indeed, according to certain modern psychologists, is often a condition of it. It was rumored to him once that he was about to join the Roman Catholic communion. Certainly, the Roman ritual always had a great attraction for him. The daily sacrifice, more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world, stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of the elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolize. He loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff flowered dalmatic slowly and with white hands move aside the veil of the tabernacle, or raising aloft the jeweled lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid wafer that at times one would fain think is indeed the panis celestis, the bread of angels, or robed in the garments of the passion of Christ, breaking the host into the chalice and smiting his breast for his sins. The fuming censers that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers, had their subtle fascination for him. As he passed out, he used to look with wonder at the black confessionals, and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them, and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives. 
but he never fell into the air of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system, or of mistaking, for a house in which to live, an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of a night, or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail. Mysticism, with its marvelous power of making common things strange to us, and the subtle antinomianism that always seems to accompany it, moved him for a season. And for a season, he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the Darwinismus movement in Germany, and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pearly cell in the brain, or some white nerve in the body, delighting in the conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions, morbid or healthy, normal or deceased. Yet, as has been said of him before, no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself. He felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment. He knew that the senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. And so he would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture, distilling heavily scented oils and burning odorous gums from the east. He saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life, and set himself to discover their true relations, wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical, and in ambergris that stirred one's passions, and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances, and in musk that troubled the brain, and in champak that stained the imagination, and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes, and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots and scented pollen-laden flowers, of aromatic balms and of dark fragrant woods, of spikenard that sickens, of hovenia that makes men mad, and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul. At another time, he devoted himself entirely to music, and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive green lacquer, he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers, or grave yellow shawled Tunisians plucked at the strained strings of monstrous lutes, while grinning Africans beat monotonously upon copper drums, and crouching upon scarlet mats, slim turbaned Indians blew through long pipes of reed or brass and charmed, or feigned to charm, great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders. The harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times, and Schubert's grace, and Chopin's beautiful sorrows, and the mighty harmonies of Beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear. He collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found, either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that have survived contact with Western civilizations, and he loved to touch and to try them. He had the mysterious Juru Paris of the Rio Negro Indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see until they have been subjected to fasting and scourging, and the earthen jars of the Peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds, and flutes of human bones, such as Alfonso de Orval heard in Chile, and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near Cusco and give forth a note of singular sweetness. He had painted gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken, the long clarin of the Mexicans, into which the performer does not blow, but through which he inhales the air, the harsh toure of the Amazon tribes, that is sounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard, it is said, at a distance of three leagues. The tepanazli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an elastic gum obtained from the milky juice of plants. The yotel bells of the Aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents like the one that Bernal Diaz saw when he went with Cortes into the Mexican temple, and of whose doleful sound 
he has left us so vivid a description. The fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him, and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art, like nature, has her monsters, things of bestial shape and with hideous voices. Yet, after some time, he wearied of them, and would sit in his box at the opera, either alone or with Lord Henry, listening in rapt pleasure to Tannhauser, and seeing in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul. On one occasion, he took up the study of jewels, and appeared at a costume ball as Anne de Joyeuse, Admiral of France, in a dress covered with 560 pearls. This taste enthralled him for years, and indeed may be said never to have left him. He would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected, such as the olive green chrysoberyl that turns red by lamplight, and the simophane with its wire like line of silver, the pistachio colored peridot, rose pink and wine yellow topazes, carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars, flame-red cinnamon stones, orange and violet spinels, and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire. He loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milky opal. He procured from Amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of color and had a turquoise de la Vey Roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs. He discovered wonderful stories also about jewels. In Alfonso's Clericalius Disciplinia, a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real jacinth, and in the romantic history of Alexander, the conqueror of Amathia was said to have found in the Vale of Jordan snakes with collars of real emeralds growing on their backs. There was a gem in the brain of the dragon, Philostratus told us, and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe, the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and slain. According to the great alchemist Pierre de Boniface, the diamond rendered a man invisible, and the agate of India made him eloquent. The Cornelian appeased anger, and the hyacinth provoked sleep, and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine. The garnet cast out demons, and the hydropecus deprived the moon of her color. The selenite waxed and waned with the moon, and the melochius that discovered thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids. Leonardus Camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad that was a certain antidote against poison. The bazor that was found in the heart of the Arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague. In the nests of Arabian birds was the aspilates that, according to Democritus, kept the wear from any danger of fire. The king of Celian rode through the city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation. The gates of the palace of John the priest were made of sardius, with the horn of the horned snake inwrought, so that no man might bring poison within. Over the gable were two golden apples, in which were two carbuncles, so that the gold might shine by day and the carbuncles by night. In Lodge's strange romance, A Marguerite of America, it was stated that in the chamber of the queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world, in chaste out of silver, looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites, carbuncles, sapphires, and green emeralds. Marco Polo had seen the inhabitants of Zipangu place rose-colored pearls in the mouths of the dead. A sea monster had been enamored of the pearl that the diver brought to King Perosi's, and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss. When the Huns lured the king into the great pit, he flung it away, Procopius tells the story, nor was it ever found again, though the emperor Anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it. The king of Malabar had shown to a certain Venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls, one for every god that he worshipped. When the Duke de Valentinosis, son of Alexander VI, visited Louis XII of France, 
His horse was loaded with gold leaves, according to Brantome, and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light. Charles of England had ridden in stirrups hung with 421 diamonds. Richard II had a coat valued at 30,000 marks, which was covered with ballast rubies. Hall described Henry VIII on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold, the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones, and a great bauderick about his neck of large ballasses. The favorites of James I wore earrings of emeralds set in gold filigree. Edward II gave to Piers Graveston a suit of red-gold armor studded with jacinths, a collar of gold roses set with turquoise stones, and a skullcap possume with pearls. Henry II wore jeweled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients. The ducal hat of Charles the Rash, the last duke of Burgundy of his race, was hung with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires. How exquisite life had once been! How gorgeous in its pomp and decoration! Even to read the luxury of the dead was wonderful. Then he turned his attention to embroideries and to the tapestries that performed the office of frescoes in the chill rooms of the northern nations of Europe. As he investigated the subject, and he always had an extraordinary faculty of becoming absolutely absorbed for the moment in whatever he took up, he was almost saddened by the reflection of the ruin that time brought on beautiful and wonderful things. He, at any rate, had escaped that. Summer followed summer, and the yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times, and nights of horror repeated their story of their shame, but he was unchanged. No winter marred his face, or stained his flower-like bloom. How different it was with material things. Where had they passed to? Where was the great crocus-colored robe on which the gods fought against the giants had been worked by brown girls for the pleasure of Athena? Where was the huge velarium that Nero had stretched across the Colosseum at Rome, that titan sail of purple on which was represented the starry sky, and Apollo driving a chariot drawn by white, gilt-reined steeds. He longed to see the curious table napkins wrought for the priest of the sun, on which were displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast. The mortuary cloth of King Chilperic, with its three hundred golden bees, the fantastic robes that excited the indignation of the Bishop of Pontius, and were figured with lions, panthers, bears, dogs, forests, rocks, hunters, all, in fact, that a painter can copy from nature. And the coat that Charles of Orleans once wore, on the sleeves of which were embroidered the verses of a song beginning, Madame, je suis tu joyeux, the musical accompaniment of the words being wrought in gold thread, and each note of square shape in those days, formed with four pearls. He read of the room that was prepared at the palace at Rhymes for the use of Queen Joan of Burgundy, and was decorated with 1,321 parrots made in broidery and blazoned with the king's arms, and 561 butterflies, whose wings were similarly ornamented with the arms of the queen, the whole worked in gold. Catherine de Medicis had a mourning bed made for her of black velvet powdered with crescents and suns. Its curtains were of damask, with leafy wreaths and garlands figured upon a gold and silver ground, and fringed along the edges with broideries of pearls, and it stood in a room hung with rows of the queen's devices in cut black velvet upon cloth of silver. Louis the Fourteenth had gold-embroidered cariatids fifteen feet high in his apartment. The state bed of Sobieski, king of Poland, was made of Smyrna gold brocade embroidered in turquoises with verses from the Koran. Its supports were of silver gilt, beautifully chased, and profusely set with enameled and jeweled medallions. It had been taken from the Turkish camp before Vienna, and the standard of Mohammed had stood beneath the tremulous gilt of its canopy. And so, for a whole year, he sought to accumulate the most exquisite specimens that he could find of textile and embroidered work, getting the dainty Delhi muslins, 
finely wrought with gold-threaded palmates and stitched over with iridescent beetles' wings. The daca gauzes that from their transparency are known in the east as woven air and running water and evening dew. Strange figured cloths from Java. Elaborate yellow Chinese hangings. Books bound in tawny satins or fair blue silks and wrought with fleurs de lis, birds and images. Veils of laces worked in hungry point. Sicilian brocades and stiff Spanish velvets. Georgian work with its gilt coins and Japanese fukusas with their green-toned golds and their marvelously plumaged birds. He had a special passion also for ecclesiastical vestments, as indeed he had for everything concerned with the service of the church. In the long cedar chests that lined the west gallery of his house, he had stored away many rare and beautiful specimens of what is really the raiment of the bride of Christ, who must wear purple and jewels and fine linen, that she may hide the pallid, macerated body that is worn by the suffering that she seeks for and wounded by self-inflicted pain. He possessed a gorgeous cope of crimson silk and gold-threaded damask, figured with a repeating pattern of golden pomegranates, set in six-petaled formal blossoms, beyond which, on either side, was the pineapple device wrought in seed pearls. The orphrase was divided into panels representing scenes from the life of the Virgin, and the coronation of the Virgin was figured in colored silks upon the hood. This was Italian work of the 15th century. Another cope was of green velvet, embroidered with heart-shaped groups of acanthus leaves from which spread long-stemmed white blossoms, the details of which were picked out with silver thread and colored crystals. The morse bore a seraph's head in gold thread raised work. The orphreys were woven in a diaper of red and gold silk and were starred with medallions of many saints and martyrs, among whom was St. Sebastian. He had chasubles also of amber-colored silk and blue and silk brocade and yellow silk damask and cloth of gold figured with representations of the passion and crucifixion of Christ and embroidered with lions and peacocks and other emblems. Dalmatics of white satin and pink silk damask decorated with tulips and dolphins and fleur-de-lis, altar frontals of crimson velvet and blue linen and many corporals, chalice veils and sudaria. In the mystic offices to which such things were put, there was something that quickened his imagination. For these treasures, and everything that he had collected in his lovely house, were to be him means of forgetfulness, modes by which he could escape for a season from the fear that seemed to him at times to be almost too great to be born. Upon the walls of the lonely locked room where he had spent so much of his boyhood, he had hung with his own hands a terrible portrait whose changing features showed him the real degradation of his life, and in front of it had draped the purple and gold pall as a curtain. For weeks he would not go there, would forget the hideous painted thing, and get back to his light heart, his wonderful joyousness, his passionate absorption in mere existence. Then, suddenly, some night he would creep out of the house, go down to the dreadful place near the Blue Gate fields, and stay there, day after day, until he was driven away. On his return, he would sit in front of her times with that pride of individualism that is half the fascination of sin, and smiling with secret pleasure at the misshapen shadow that had to bear the burden of what should have been his own. After a few years, he could not endure to be long out of England, and gave up the villa that he had shared at Trouville with Henry, as well as the little white-walled house in Algiers, where they had more than once spent the winter. He hated to be separated from the picture that was such a part of his life, and was also afraid that during his absence someone might gain access to the room, in spite of the elaborate bars that he had caused to be placed upon the door. He was quite conscious that this would tell them nothing. It was true that the portrait still preserved, under all the foulness and ugliness of the face, its marked likeness to himself. But what could they learn from that? He would laugh at anyone who tried to taunt him. He had not painted it. What was it to him how vile and full of shame it looked? Even if he told them, would they believe it? Yet, he was afraid. 
sometimes, when he was down at his great house in Nottinghamshire, entertaining the fashionable young men of his own rank who were his chief companions, and astounding the country by the wanton luxury and gorgeous splendor of his mode of life, he would suddenly leave his guests and rush back to town to see that the door had not been tampered with and that the picture was still there. What if it should be stolen? The mere thought made him cold with horror. Surely the world would know his secret then. Perhaps the world already suspected it. For, while he fascinated many, there were not a few who distrusted him. He was very nearly blackballed at a West End club, of which his birth and social position fully entitled him to become a member. And it was said that on one occasion, when he was brought by a friend into the smoking room at the Churchill, the Duke of Berwick and another gentleman got up in a marked manner and went out. Curious stories became current about him after he had passed his 25th year. It was rumored that he had been seen brawling with foreign sailors in a low den in the distant parts of Whitechapel, and that he consorted with thieves and coiners and knew the mysteries of their trade. His extraordinary absences became notorious, and when he used to reappear again in society, men would whisper to each other in corners, or pass him with a sneer, or look at him with cold, searching eyes, as though they were determined to discover his secret. Of such insolences and attempted slights, he of course took no notice, and in the opinion of most people, his frank, debonair manner, his charming boyish smile, and the infinite grace of that wonderful youth that seemed never to leave him, were in themselves a sufficient answer to the calumnies, for so they termed them, that were circulated about him. It was remarked, however, that some of those who had been most intimate with him appeared, after a time, to shun him. Women who had wildly adored him, and for his sake had braved all social censure and set convention at defiance, were seen to grow pallid with shame or horror if Dorian Gray entered the room. Yet these whispered scandals only increased in the eyes of many his strange and dangerous charm. His great wealth was a certain element of security. Society, and civilized society at least, is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are both rich and fascinating. It feels instinctively that manners are of more importance than morals, and, in its opinion, the highest respectability is of much less value than the possession of a good chef. And after all, it is a very poor consolation to be told that the man who has given one a bad dinner or poor wine is irreproachable in his private life. Even the cardinal virtues cannot atone for half-cold entrees, as Lord Henry remarked once in a discussion on the subject, and there is possibly a good deal to be said for his view. For the canons of good society are, or should be, the same as the canons of art. Form is absolutely essential to it. It should have the dignity of a ceremony, as well as its unreality, and should combine the insincere character of a romantic play with the wit and beauty that makes such plays delightful to us. Is insincerity such a terrible thing? Think not. It is merely a method by which we can multiply our personalities. Such, at any rate, was Dorian Gray's opinion. He used to wonder at the shallow psychology of those who conceive the ego in a man as a thing simple, permanent, reliable, and of one essence. To him, man was a being with myriad lives and myriad sensations, a complex multiform creature that bore within its strange legacies of thought and passion, and whose very flesh was tainted with the monstrous maladies of the dead. He loved to stroll through the gaunt, cold picture gallery of his country house and look at the various portraits of those whose blood flowed in his veins. Here was Philip Herbert, described by Francis Osborne in his memories on the reigns of Queen Elizabeth and King James as one who was caressed by the court for his handsome face, which kept him not long company. Was it young Herbert's life that he sometimes led? Had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own? Was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance 
in Basil Hallward's studio, to the mad prayer that had so changed his life. Here, in gold-embroidered red doublet, jeweled surcoat, and gilt-edged ruff and wristbands, stood Sir Anthony Sherrod, with his silver and black armor piled at his feet. What had this man's legacy been? Had the lover of Giovanna of Naples bequeathed him some inheritance of sin and shame? Were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had not dared to realize? Here, from the fading canvas, smiled Lady Elizabeth Devereux in her gauze hood, pearl stomacher, and pink slashed sleeves. A flower was in her right hand, and her left clasped an enameled collar of white and damask roses. On a table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple. There were large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes. He knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers. Had he something of her temperament in him? These oval, heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him. What of George Willoughby, with his powdered hair and fantastic patches? How evil he looked. The face was saturnine and swarthy, and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain. Delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings. He had been a macaroni of the 18th century, and the friend in his youth of Lord Ferrars. What of the second Lord Beckenham, the companion of the Prince Regent in his wildest days, and one of the witnesses at the secret marriage with Mrs. Fitzherbert? How proud and handsome he was, with his chestnut curls and insolent pose. What passions had he bequeathed? The world had looked upon him as infamous. He had led the orgies at Carlton House. The star of the garter glittered upon his breast. Beside him hung the portrait of his wife, a pallid, thin-lipped woman in black. Her blood also stirred within him. How curious it all seemed. And his mother, with her Lady Hamilton face and her moist, wine-dashed lips, he knew what he had got from her. He had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others. She laughed at him in her loose bacchanate dress. There were vine leaves in her hair. The purple spilled from the cup she was holding. The carnations of the painting had withered, but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of color. They seemed to follow him wherever he went. Yet one had ancestors in literature as well as in one's own race. Nearer, perhaps, in type and temperament, many of them, and certainly with an influence of which one was more absolutely conscious. There were times when it appeared to Dorian Gray that the whole of history was merely a record of his own life, not as he had lived it in act and circumstance, but as his imagination had created it for him, as it had been in his brain and in his passions. He felt that he had known them all, those strange, terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvelous and evil so full of subtlety. It seemed to him that in some mysterious way their lives had been his own. The hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life had himself known this curious fancy. In the seventh chapter he tells how, crowned with laurel, lest lightning might strike him, he had sat as Tiberius in a garden at Capri, reading the shameful books of Elephantus, while dwarves and peacocks strutted round him, and the flute player mocked the swinger of the censer, and, as Caligula, had caroused with the green-shirted jockeys in their stables, and supped in an ivory manger with a jewel-frontleted horse, and, as Domitian, had wandered through a corridor lined with marble mirrors, looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days, and sick with that ennui, that terrible tedium vitae that comes on those to whom life denies nothing, and had peered through a clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus, and then, in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules, had been carried through the street of pomegranates to a house of gold, and heard men cry on Nero Caesar as he passed by. And, as Elagabalus had painted his face with colors, and plied the distaff among the women, and brought the moon from Carthage, and given her in mystic marriage to the sun. 
Over and over again, Dorian used to read this fantastic chapter, and the two chapters immediately following, in which, as in some curious tapestries or cunningly wrought enamels, were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad. Lippio, Duke of Milan, who slew his wife and painted her lips with a scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead thing he fondled. Pietro Barbi, Venetian, known as Paul II, who sought in his vanity to assume the title of Formosus, and whose tiara, valued at 200,000 florins, was bought at the price of a terrible sin. Gian Maria Visconti, who used hounds to chase living men, and whose murdered body was covered with roses by a harlot who had loved him. The Borgia on his white horse, with fratricide riding beside him, and his mantle stained with the blood of Perotto. Pietro Rario, the young cardinal archbishop of Florence, child and minion of Sixtus IV, whose beauty was equaled only by his debauchery, and who received Leonora of Aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk, filled with nymphs and centaurs, and gilded a boy that he might serve at the feast as Ganymede or Hylas. Ezeline, whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death, and who had a passion for red blood, as other men have for red wine, the son of the fiend, as was reported, and one who had cheated his father at dice when gambling with him for his own soul. Giambattista Sibo, who in mockery took the name of Innocent, and into whose torpid veins the blood of three lads was infused by a Jewish doctor. Sigismondo Malatesta, the lover of Isota and the lord of Rimini, whose effigy was burned at Rome as the enemy of God and man, who strangled Polissina with a napkin and gave poison to Genova de Este in a cup of emerald, and in honor of a shameful passion built a pagan church for Christian worship. Charles VI, who had so wildly adored his brother's wife that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming on him, and who, when his brain had sickened and grown strange, could only be soothed by Saracen cards painted with the images of love and death and madness. And in his trimmed jerkin and jeweled cap and acanthus-like curls, Griffonetto Baglioni, who slew Astore with his bride and Simonetto with his page, and whose comeliness was such that, as he lay dying in the yellow piazza of Perugia, those who hated him could not choose but weep, and Atalanta, who had cursed him, blessed him. There was a horrible fascination in them all. He saw them at night, and they troubled his imagination in the day. The Renaissance knew of strange manners of poisoning. Poisoning by a helmet and a lighted torch, by an embroidered glove and a jeweled fan, by a gilded pomander and an amber chain. Dorian Gray had been poisoned by a book. There were moments when he looked on evil, simply as a mode through which he could realize his conception of the beautiful. Chapter 12 It was on the 9th of November, the eve of his own 38th birthday, as he often remembered afterwards. He was walking home about 11 o'clock from Lord Henry's, where he had been dining and was wrapped in heavy furs as the night was cold and foggy. At the corner of Grosvenor Square and South Audley Street, a man passed him in the mist, walking very fast and with the collar of his grey ulster turned up. He had a bag in his hand. Dorian recognized him. It was Basil Hallward. A strange sense of fear, for which he could not account, came over him. He made no sign of recognition and went on quickly in the direction of his own house. But Hallward had seen him. Dorian heard him first stopping on the pavement and then hurrying after him. In a few moments his hand was on his arm. Dorian! What an extraordinary piece of luck! I've been waiting for you in your library ever since nine o'clock. Finally I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed, as he let me out. I am off to Paris by the midnight train, and I particularly wanted to see you before I left. I thought it was you or rather your fur coat as you passed me, but I wasn't quite sure. Didn't you recognize me? In this fog, my dear Basil, why, I can't even recognize Grosvenor Square. I believe my house is somewhere about here, but... I don't feel at all certain about it. I am sorry you are going away, as I have not seen you for ages, but I suppose you'll be back soon? 
No, I'm going to be out of England for six months. I intend to take a studio in Paris and shut myself up until I have finished a great picture I have in my head. However, it wasn't about myself I wanted to talk. Here we are at your door. Let me come in for a moment. I have something to say to you. I shall be charmed, but won't you miss your train? said Dorian languidly as he passed up the steps and opened the door with his latch key. The lamplight struggled out and through the fog, and Hallward looked at his watch. I have heaps of time, he answered. The train doesn't go till twelve fifteen, and it's only just eleven. In fact, I was on my way to the club to look for you when I met you. You see, I shan't have any delay about luggage, as I have sent on my heavy things. All I have with me is in this bag, and I can easily get to Victoria in twenty minutes. Dorian looked at him and smiled. What a way for a fashionable painter to travel. A gladstone bag and an ulster. Come in or the fog will get into the house. And mind, we don't talk about anything serious. Nothing is serious nowadays. At least nothing should be. Hallward shook his head as he entered and followed Dorian into the library. There was a bright wood fire blazing in the large open hearth. The lamps were lit, and an open Dutch silver spirit case stood, with some siphons of soda water and large cut glass tumblers on a little marquetry table. You see, your servant made quite made me quite at home, Dorian. He gave me everything I wanted, including your best gold tip cigarettes. He's a most hospitable creature. I like him much better than the Frenchman you used to have. What has become of the Frenchman, by the by? Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I believe he married Lady Radley's maid and has established her in Paris as an English dressmaker. Anglomania is very fashionable over there now, I hear. It seems silly of the French, doesn't it? But, do you know, he was not at all a bad servant. I never liked him, but I had nothing to complain about. One often imagines things that are quite absurd. He was really very devoted to me and seemed quite sorry when he went away. Have another brandy and soda? Or would you like a hock and seltzer? I always take hock and seltzer myself. There are sure to be some in the next room. Oh, thanks, I won't have anything more, said the painter, taking his cap and coat off and throwing them on the bag that he had placed in the corner. And now, my dear fellow, I want to speak to you seriously. Don't frown like that. You make it so much more difficult for me. What is all about? cried Dorian in his petulant way, flinging himself down on the sofa. Ugh, I hope it is not about myself. I am tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself answered Hallward in his grave, deep voice. And I must say it to you. I shall only keep you half an hour. Dorian sighed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. It is not much to ask of you, Dorian, and it is entirely for your own sake that I am speaking. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said against you in London. I don't wish to know anything about them. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself don't interest me. They have not got the charm of novelty. They must interest you, Dorian. Every gentleman is interested in his good name. You don't want people to talk of you as something vile and degraded. Of course, you have your position and your wealth and all that kind of thing, but position and wealth are not everything. Mind you, I don't believe these rumors at all. At least I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. People talk sometimes of secret vices. There are no such things. If a wretched man has a vice, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the droop of his eyelids, the molding of his hands, even. Somebody, I won't mention his name, but you know him, came to me last year to have his portrait done. I had never seen him before and had never heard anything about him at the time, though I have heard a good deal since. He offered an extravagant price. I refused him. There was something in the shape of his fingers that I hated. I know now that I was quite right in what I fancied about him. His life is dreadful. But you, Dorian, with your pure, bright, innocent face and your marvelous, untroubled youth, I can't believe anything against you. And yet I see you very seldom, and you never come down to the studio now, and when I am away from you, and I hear all these hideous things that people are whispering about you, I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian, that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of a club when you enter it? Why is it that so many gentlemen in London will neither go to your house or invite you to theirs? You used to be a friend of Lord Staveley, and I met him at dinner last week. Your name happened to come up in conversation, in connection with the miniatures you have lent the exhibition at the Dudley. 
Stavely curled his lip and said that you might have the most artistic taste, but that you were a man whom no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know, and whom no chaste woman should sit in the same room with. I reminded him that I was a friend of yours and asked him what he meant. He told me. He told me right out before everybody. It was horrible. Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? There was that wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his great friend. There was Sir Henry Ashton, who had to leave England with a tarnished name. You and he were inseparable. What about Aidan Singleton and his dreadful end? What about Lord Kent's only son and his career? I met his father yesterday in James Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. What about the young Duke of Perth? What sort of life has he got now? What gentleman would associate with him? Stop, Basil. You are talking about things of which you know nothing, said Dorian, biting his lip with a note of infinite contempt in his voice. You ask me why Berwick leaves a room when I enter it? It is because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. With such blood as he has in his veins, how could his record be clean? You ask me about Henry Ashton and young Perth? Did I teach the ones his vices, the other his debauchery? If Kent's silly son takes his wife from the streets, what is that to me? If Adrian Singleton writes his friend's name across a bill, am I his keeper? I know how people chatter in England. The middle classes air their moral prejudices over their gross dinner tables and whisper about what they call profligacies of their betters in order to try and pretend that they are smart in society and on intimate terms with the people they slander. In this country, it is enough for a man to have distinction in brains for every common tongue to wag against him. And what sort of lives do these people who pose as being moral lead themselves? My dear fellow, you forget that we are in the native land of the hypocrite. Dorian, cried Hallworth, that is not the question. England is bad enough, I know, and English society is all wrong. That is the reason why I want you to be fine. You have not been fine. One has a right to judge of a man by the effect he has over his friends. Yours seem to lose all sense of honor, of goodness, of purity. You have filled them with a madness for pleasure. They have gone down into the depths. You lead them there. Yes, you led them there, and yet you can smile as you're smiling now. And there is worse behind. I know you and Harry are inseparable. Surely for that reason, if for none other, you should have not have made his sister's name a byword. Take care, Basil. You go too far. I must speak, and you must listen. You shall listen. When you met Lady Gwendolen, not a breath of scandal had ever touched her. Is there a single decent woman in London now who would drive with her in the park? Why, even her children are not allowed to live with her. Then there are other stories, stories that you have been seen creeping at dawn out of dreadful houses and slinking in disguise into the foulest dens in London. Are they true? Can they be true? When I first heard them, I laughed. I hear them now, and they make me shudder. What about your country house and the life that is led there? Dorian, you don't know what is said about you. I won't tell you that I don't want to preach to you. I remember Harry saying once that every man who turned himself into an amateur curate for the moment always began by saying that and then proceeded to break his word. I do want to preach to you. I want you to lead such a life as will make the world respect you. I want you to have a clean name and a fair record. I want you to get rid of the dreadful people you associate with. Don't shrug your shoulders like that. Don't be so indifferent. You have a wonderful influence. Let it be for good, not for evil. They say that you corrupt everyone with whom you become intimate, and that is quite sufficient for you to enter a house for shame for some kind to follow after. I don't know whether it is so or not. How should I know? But it is said of you. I am told things that seem impossible to doubt. Lord Gloucester was one of my greatest friends at Oxford. He showed me a letter that his wife had written to him when she was dying alone in her villa at Mentone. Your name was implicated in the most terrible confession I ever read. I told him that it was absurd, that I knew you thoroughly, and that you were incapable of anything of the kind. Know you? I wonder, do I know you? Before I could answer that, I should have to see your soul. To see my soul? muttered Dorian Gray, starting up from the sofa and turning almost white from fear. Yes, answered Hallward gravely and with a deep-toned sorrow in his voice. 
to see your soul. But only God can do that. A bitter laugh of mockery broke from the lips of the younger man. You shall see it yourself tonight, he cried, seizing a lamp from the table. Come, it is your own handiwork. Why shouldn't you look at it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards if you choose. Nobody would believe you. If they did believe you, they would like me all the better for it. I know the age better than you do, though you will prate about it so tediously. Come, I tell you. You have chattered enough about corruption. Now you shall look on it face to face. There was the madness of pride in every word he uttered. He stamped his foot upon the ground in his boyish, insolent manner. He felt a terrible joy at the thought that someone else was to share his secret, and that the man who had painted the portrait that was the origin of all his shame was to be burdened for the rest of his life with the hideous memory of what he had done. Yes, he continued, coming closer to him and looking steadfastly into his stern eyes. I shall show you my soul. You shall see the thing that you fancy only God can see. Hallward started back. This is blasphemy, Dorian, he cried. You must not say things like that. They are horrible, and they don't mean anything. You think so? <laughs> he laughed again. I know so. As for what I said to you tonight, I said it for your own good. You know I've always been a staunch friend of yours. Don't touch me. Finish what you have to say. A twisted flash of pain shot across the painter's face. He paused for a moment and a wild feeling of pity came over him. After all, what right had he to pry into the life of Dorian Gray? If he had done a tithe of what was rumored about him, how much he must have suffered. Then he straightened himself up and walked over to the fireplace and stood there, looking at the burning logs with their frost-like ashes and their throbbing cores of flame. "'I'm waiting, Basil,' said the younger man in a hard, clear voice. He turned around. "'What I have to say is this,' he cried. "'You must give me some answer to these horrible charges that are made against you. "'If you tell me that they are absolutely untrue from beginning to end, I shall believe you. "'Deny them, Dorian. Deny them. "'Can't you see what I'm going through? My God, don't tell me that you are bad and corrupt and shameful.' "'Dorian Gray smiled. "'There was a curl of contempt in his lips. "'Come upstairs, Basil.' he said quietly. Keep a diary of my life from day to day, and it never leaves the room in which it is written. I shall show it to you if you come with me. I shall come with you, Dorian, if you wish it. I see I have missed my train. That makes no matter, I can go tomorrow. But don't ask me to read anything tonight. All I want is a plain answer to my question. That shall be given to you upstairs. I could not give it here. You will not have to read long. Chapter 13 He passed out of the room and began the ascent, Basil Hallward following close behind. They walked softly, as men do instinctively at night. The lamp cast fantastic shadows on the wall and staircase. A rising wind made some of the windows rattle. When they reached the top landing, Dorian set the lamp down on the floor and, taking out the key, turned it in the lock. You insist on knowing, Basil? He asked in a low voice. Yes. I am delighted, he answered, smiling. Then he added, somewhat harshly, You are the one man in the world who is entitled to know everything about me. You have had more to do with my life than you think. And taking up the lamp, he opened the door and went in. A cold current of air passed them and the light shot up for a moment in the flame of a murky orange. A cold current of air passed them, and the light shot up for a moment in a flame of murky orange. He shuddered. Shut the door behind you, he whispered, as he placed the lamp on the table. Hallward glanced round him with a puzzled expression. The room looked as if it had not been lived in for years. A faded Flemish tapestry, a curtained picture, an old Italian cassone, and an almost empty bookcase. That was all it seemed to contain, besides a chair and a table. As Dorian Gray was lighting a half-burned candle that was standing on the mantel shelf, 
He saw the whole place was covered with dust, and the carpet was in holes. A mouse ran scuffling behind the wainscoting. There was a damp odor of mildew. So you think that it is only God who sees the soul, Basil? Draw that curtain back, and you will see mine. The voice that spoke was cold and cruel. You're mad, Dorian, or playing a part, muttered Hallward, frowning. You won't? Then I must do it myself, said the young man. And he tore the curtain from its rod and flung it on the ground. An exclamation of horror broke from the painter's lips as he saw in the dim light the hideous face on the canvas grinning at him. There was something in its expression that filled him with disgust and loathing. Good heavens, it was Dorian Gray's own face he was looking at. The horror, whatever it was, had not yet entirely spoiled that marvelous beauty. There was still some gold in the thinning hair and some scarlet on the sensual mouth. The sodden eyes had kept something of the loveliness of their blue. The noble curves had not yet completely passed away from the chiseled nostrils and from plastic throat. Yes, it was Dorian himself. But who had done it? He seemed to recognize his own brushwork. And that frame was his own design. The idea was monstrous, yet he felt afraid. He seized the lighted candle and held it to the picture. In the left-hand corner was his own name, traced in long letters of bright vermilion. It was some foul parody, some infamous ignoble satire. He had never done that. Still, it was his own picture. He knew it, and he felt as if his blood had changed in a moment from fire to sluggish ice. His own picture? What did it mean? Why had it altered? He turned and looked at Dorian Gray with the eyes of a sick man. His mouth twitched, and his parched tongue seemed unable to articulate. He passed his hand across his forehead. It was dank with clammy sweat. The young man was leaning against the mantel shelf, watching him with that strange expression that one sees on the faces of those who are absorbed in a play when some great artist is acting. There was neither real sorrow in it, nor real joy. There was simply the passion of the spectator, with perhaps a flicker of triumph in his eyes. He had taken the flower out of his coat and was smelling it, or pretending to do so. "'What does this mean?' cried Hallward at last. His own voice sounded shrill and curious in his ears. "'Years ago, when I was a boy,' said Dorian Gray, crushing the flower in his hand, "'you met me.' flattered me, taught me to be vain of my good looks. One day you introduced me to a friend of yours who explained to me the wonder of youth, and you finished a portrait of me that revealed to me the wonder of beauty. In a mad moment that even now I don't know whether I regret or not, I made a wish. Perhaps you will call it a prayer. I remember it. Oh, how well I remember it. No, the thing is impossible. The room is damp. Mildew has gotten to the canvas. The paints I used had some wretched mineral poison in them. I tell you, the thing is impossible. Oh, what is impossible, murmured the young man, going over to the window and leaning his forehead against the cold, mist-stained glass. You told me you had destroyed it. I was wrong. It has destroyed me. I don't believe it is my picture. Can't you see your ideal in it? said Dorian bitterly. My ideal, as you call it, as you called it. There was nothing evil in it, nothing shameful. You were to me such an ideal as I shall never meet again. This is the face of a satyr. It is the face of my soul. Christ! What a thing I must have worshipped. It has the eyes of a devil. Each of us has heaven and hell in him, Basil, cried Dorian, with a wild gesture of despair. Hallward turned again to the portrait and gazed at it. My God! If it is true, he exclaimed, and this is what you have done with your life, why, 
you must be worse, even, than those who talk against you fancy you to be. He held the light up again to the canvas and examined it. The surface seemed to be quite undisturbed, and as he had left it, it was from within, apparently, that the foulness and the horror had come. Through some strange quickening of inner life, the leprosies of sin were slowly eating the thing away. The rotting of a corpse in a watery grave was not so fearful. His hand shook, and the candle fell from its socket on the floor and lay there, sputtering. He placed his foot on it and put it out. Then he flung himself into the rickety chair that was standing by the table and buried his face in his hands. Good God, Dorian, what a lesson. What an awful lesson. There was no answer, but he could hear the young man sobbing at the window. Pray, Dorian, pray, he murmured. What is it that one was taught to say in one's boyhood? Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our sins. Wash away our iniquities. Let us say that together. The prayer of your pride has been answered. The prayer of your repentance will be answered also. I worshipped you too much. I am punished for it. You worshipped yourself too much. We are both punished. Dorian Gray turned slowly around and looked at him with tear-dimmed eyes. It, it is too late, Basil, he faltered. It is never too late, Dorian. Let us kneel down and try if we cannot remember a prayer. Isn't there a verse somewhere? Though your sins be as scarlet, yet I will make them as white as snow? Those words mean nothing to me now. Hush, don't say that. You have done enough evil in your life. My God, don't you see that accursed thing leering at us? Dorian Gray glanced at the picture, and suddenly an uncontrollable feeling of hatred for Basil Hallward came over him, as though it had been suggested to him by the image on the canvas, whispered into his ear by those grinning lips. The mad passions of a hunted animal stirred within him, and he loathed the man who was seated at the table. More than in his whole life he had ever loathed anything. He glanced wildly around. Something glimmered on the top of the painted chest that faced him. His eye fell on it. He knew what it was. It was a knife that he had brought up some days before to cut a piece of cord, and he'd forgotten to take it away with him. He moved slowly towards it, passing hallward as he did so. As soon as he got behind him, he seized it and turned round. Hallward stirred in his chair as if he was going to rise. He rushed at him and dug the knife into the great vein that is behind the ear, crushing the man's head down on the table and stabbing again and again. There was a stifled groan and the horrible sound of someone choking with blood. Three times the outstretched arms shot up convulsively, waving grotesque, stiff-fingered hands in the air. He stabbed him twice more, but the man did not move. Something began to trickle on the floor. He waited for a moment, still pressing the head down. Then he threw the knife on the table and listened. He could hear nothing but the drip, drip on the threadbare carpet. He opened the door and went out onto the landing. The house was absolutely quiet. No one was about. For a few seconds he stood bending over the balustrade and peering down into the black, seething well of darkness. Then he took out the key and returned to the room, locking himself in as he did so. The thing was still seated in the chair, straining over the table with bowed head and humped back and long, fantastic arms. Had it not been for the red, jagged tear in the neck and the clotted black pool that was slowly widening on the table, one would have said the man was simply asleep. How quickly it had all been done. He felt strangely calm, and walking over to the window, opened it and stepped out onto the balcony. The wind had blown the fog away, and the sky was like a monstrous peacock's tail, starred with myriads of golden eyes. He looked down and saw the policeman going his rounds, and flashing the long beam of his lantern on the doors of the silent houses. The crimson spot of a prowling hansom gleamed at the corner and then vanished. A woman in a fluttering shawl was creeping slowly by the railings, staggering as she went. 
Now and then she stopped and peered back. Once, she began to sing in a hoarse voice. The policeman strolled over and said something to her. She stumbled away, laughing. A bitter blast swept across the square. The gas lamps flickered and became blue, and the leafless trees shook their black iron branches to and fro. He shivered and went back, closing the window behind him. Having reached the door, he turned the key and opened it. He did not even glance at the murdered man. He felt that the secret of the whole thing was to not realize the situation. The friend who had painted the fatal portrait, to which all his misery had been due, had gone out of his life. That was enough. Then he remembered the lamp. It was a rather curious one of Moorish workmanship, made of dull silver, inlaid with arabesques of burnished steel, and studded with coarse turquoises. Perhaps it might be missed by his servant, and questions would be asked. He hesitated for a moment, and then he turned back and took it from the table. He could not help seeing the dead thing. How still it was. How horribly white the long hands looked. It was like a dreadful wax image. Having locked the door behind him, he crept quietly downstairs. The woodwork creaked and seemed to cry out as if in pain. He stopped several times and waited. No, everything was still. It was merely the sound of his own footsteps. When he reached the library, he saw the bag and coat in the corner. They must be hidden away somewhere. He unlocked a secret press that was in the wainscoting a press in which he kept his own curious disguises, and put them into it. He could easily burn them afterwards. Then he pulled out his watch. It was twenty minutes to two. He sat down and began to think. Every year, every month almost, men were strangled in England for what he had done. There had been a madness of murder in the air. Some red star had come too close to the earth. And yet... What evidence was there against him? Basil Hallward had left the house at eleven. No, it had seen him come in again. Most of the servants were at Selby Royal. His valet had gone to bed. Paris. Yes, it was to Paris that Basil had gone, and by the midnight train, as he had intended. With his curious reserved habits, it would be months before any suspicions would be roused. Months. Everything could be destroyed long before then. A sudden thought struck him. He put on his fur coat and hat and went out into the hall. There he paused, hearing the slow, heavy tread of the policeman on the pavement outside and seeing the flash of the bullseye reflected in the window. He waited and held his breath. After a few moments, he drew back the latch and slipped out, shutting the door very gently behind him. Then he began ringing the bell. In about five minutes his valet appeared, half-dressed and looking very drowsy. "'I'm sorry I've had to wake you up, Francis,' he said, stepping in. "'But I'd forgotten my latch key. What time is it?' Ten minutes past two, sir,' answered the man, looking at the clock and blinking. Ten minutes past two? How horribly late! You must wake me at nine tomorrow. I have some work to do.' All right, sir. Did anyone call this evening? Mr. Hallward, sir. He stayed here till eleven and then went away to catch his train. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't see him. Did he leave any message? No, sir, except that he would write to you from Paris if he did not find you at the club. That will do, Francis. Don't forget to call me at nine tomorrow. No, sir. The man shambled down the passage in his slippers. Dorian Gray threw his hat and coat upon the table and pressed into the library. For a quarter of an hour, he walked up and down the room, biting his lip and thinking. Then he took down the blue book from one of the shelves and began to turn over the leaves. Alan Campbell, 152 Hetford Street, Mayfair. Yes, that was the man he wanted. Chapter 14 at nine o'clock the next morning, his servant came in with a cup of chocolate on a tray and opened the shutters. 
Dorian was sleeping quite peacefully, lying on his right side with one hand underneath his cheek. He looked like a boy who had been tired out with play or study. The man had to touch him twice on the shoulder before he woke, and as he opened his eyes, a faint smile passed across his lips, as though he had been lost in some delightful dream. Yet he had not dreamed at all. His night had been untroubled by any images of pleasure or pain, but youth smiles without any reason. It is one of its chiefest charms. He turned round, and leaning upon his elbow began to sip his chocolate. The mellow November sun came streaming into the room. The sky was bright, and there was a genial warmth in the air. It was almost like a morning in May. Gradually, the events of the preceding night crept with silent, blood-stained feet into his brain, and reconstructed themselves there with terrible distinctness. He winced at the memory of all that he had suffered, and for a moment the same curious feeling of loathing for Basil Hallward that made him kill him as he sat in the chair came back to him, and he grew cold with passion. The dead man was still sitting there, too, and in the sunlight now. How horrible that was! Such hideous things were for the darkness, not for the day. He felt that if he brooded on what he had gone through, he would sicken or grow mad. There were sins whose fascination was more in the memory than in the doing of them, strange triumphs that gratified the pride more than the passions, and gave to the intellect a quickened sense of joy, greater than any joy they brought or could ever bring to the senses. But this was not one of them. It was a thing to be driven out of the mind, to be drugged with poppies, to be strangled, lest it might strangle one itself. When the half-hour struck, he passed his hand across his forehead, and then got up hastily and dressed himself, with even more than usual care, giving a good deal of attention to the choice of his necktie and scarf pin, and changing his rings more than once. He spent a long time also over breakfast, tasting the various dishes, talking to his valet about some new liveries that he was thinking of getting made for the servants at Selby, and going through his correspondence. At some of the letters he smiled. Three of them bored him. One he read several times over and then tore it up with a slight look of annoyance in his face. That awful thing, a woman's memory, as Lord Henry had once said. After he had drunk his cup of black coffee, he wiped his lips slowly with a napkin, motioned to his servant to wait, and going over to the table sat down and wrote two letters. One he put in his pocket, the other he handed to the valet. Take this round to 152 Hertford Street, Francis, and if Mr. Campbell is out of town, get his address. As soon as he was alone, he lit a cigarette and began sketching upon a piece of paper, drawing first flowers and bits of architecture, then human faces. Suddenly he remarked that every face he drew seemed to have a fantastic likeness to Basil Hallward. He frowned, and getting up he went over to the bookcase and took out a volume at hazard. He was determined that he would not think about what had happened until it became absolutely necessary that he should do so. When he had stretched himself on the sofa, he looked at the title page of the book. It was Gautier's Emir Ekeme, Charpentier's Japanese paper edition, with the Jacquemart etching. The binding was of citron green leather, with a design of gilt trellis work and dotted pomegranates. It had been given to him by Adrian Singleton. As he turned over the pages, his eye fell on the poem about the hand of La Sonnière, the cold yellow hand, not yet cleaned from torment, and its downy red hairs and its digits of a fawn. He glanced at his own white taper fingers, shuddering slightly in spite of himself, and passed on till he came to those lovely stanzas upon Venice. On a chromatic scale, dripping with pearls, the Venus of the Adriatic emerges, her body rosy and white, the domes and the azure water, because of the contour's purity of the phrase, swell and round, rise up for a love sigh. The skiff approaches and puts me down, casting his line to the pillar before a facade of rose on a marble staircase. How exquisite they were! As one read them, one seemed to be floating down the green waterways of the pink and pearl city, seated in a black gondola with silver prow and trailing curtains. The mere lines looked to him like those straight lines of turquoise blue that followed one as one pushes out to the Lido. The sudden flashes of color reminded him of the gleam of the opal and iris-throated birds that fluttered round the tall honeycomb campanile or stalk with such stately grace through the dim, dust-stained arcades. Leaning back with half-closed eyes, he kept saying over and over to himself, before a facade of rose on a marble staircase. The whole of Venice was in those two lines. He remembered the autumn that he passed there, and a wonderful love that had stirred him to mad delight follies. There was a romance in every place, 
but Venice, like Oxford, had kept the background for romance and, to the true romantic, background was everything, or almost everything. Basil had been with him part of the time and had gone wild over Tinneret. Poor Basil. What a horrible way for a man to die. He sighed and took up the volume again and tried to forget. He read of the swallows that fly in and out of the little café at Smyrna, where the hajis sit counting their amber beads and the turbaned merchants smoke their long tasseled pipes and talk gravely to each other. He read of the obelisk in the Palace de la Concorde that sweeps tears of granite into its lonely, sunless exile and longs to be back by the hot, lotus-covered Nile, where there are sphinxes and rose-red ibises and white vultures with gilded claws and crocodiles with small, barrel eyes that crawl over the green, steaming mud. He began to brood over those verses, which, drawing music from kiss-stained marble, tell of that curious statue that Gautier compares to a contra-alto voice, the monstre charmant that couches in the porphyry room of the Louvre. But after a time the book fell from his hand. He grew nervous, and a horrible fit of terror came over him. What if Alan Campbell should be out of England? Days would elapse before he could come back. Perhaps he might refuse to come. What could he do then? Every moment was of vital importance. They had been great friends once, five years before, almost inseparable indeed. Then the intimacy had come suddenly to an end. When they met in society now, it was only Dorian Gray who smiled. Alan Campbell never did. He was an extremely clever young man, though he had no real appreciation of the visible arts, and whatever little sense of the beauty of poetry he possessed, he gained entirely from Dorian. His dominant intellectual passion was for science. At Cambridge, he had spent a great deal of his time working in the laboratory, and had taken a good class in the natural science tripos of his year. Indeed, he was still devoted to the study of chemistry, and had a laboratory of his own in which he used to shut himself up all day long, greatly to the annoyance of his mother, who had set her heart on his standing for Parliament and had a vague idea that a chemist was a person who made up prescriptions. He was an excellent musician, however, and played both the violin and piano better than most amateurs. In fact, it was music that had first brought him and Dorian Gray together. Music, and that indefinable attraction that Dorian seemed to be able to exercise whenever he wished, and indeed exercised often, without being conscious of it. They had met at Lady Berkshire's the night that Rubenstein played there, and after that they used to always be seen together at the opera and wherever good music was going on. For eighteen months their intimacy lasted. Campbell was always either at Sebel Royale or Grosner Square. To him, as to many others, Dorian was the type of everything that is wonderful and fascinating in life. Whether or not a quarrel had taken place between them, no one ever knew. But suddenly, people remarked that they scarcely spoke when they met, and that Campbell seemed always to go away early from any party at which Dorian Gray was present. He had changed, too, was strangely melancholy at times, appeared almost to dislike hearing music, and would never himself play giving as his excuse, when he was called upon, that he was so absorbed in science that he had no time left in which to practice. And this was clearly true. Every day he seemed to become more interested in biology, and his name appeared once or twice in some of the scientific reviews in connection with certain curious experiments. This was the man Dorian Gray was waiting for. Every second he kept glancing at the clock. As the minutes went by, he became horribly agitated. At last, he got up and began to pace up and down the room, looking like a beautiful caged thing. He took long, stealthy strides. His hands were curiously cold. The suspense became unbearable. Time seemed to him to be crawling with feet of lead, while he, by monstrous winds, was being swept towards the jagged edge of some black cleft of precipice. He knew what was waiting for him there, saw it, indeed, and shuddering, crushed with dank hands, his burning lids as though he would have robbed the very brain of sight and driven the eyeballs back into their cave. It was useless. The brain had its own food on which it battened, and the imagination, made grotesque by terror, twisted and distorted as living thing by pain, danced like some foul puppet on a strand and grinned through moving masks. Then, suddenly, time stopped for him. Yes, that blind, slow-breathing thing crawled no more, and horrible thoughts, time being dead, raced nimbly on in front, and dragged a hideous future from its grave, and showed it to him. He stared at it. Its very horror made him stone. At last the door opened and his servant entered. He turned glazed eyes upon him. "'Mr. Campbell, sir,' said the man. 
a sigh of relief broke from his parched lips, and the color came back to his cheeks. Ask him to come in at once, Francis. He felt that he was himself again. His mood of cowardice had passed away. The man bowed and retired. In a few moments, Ellen Campbell walked in, looking very stern and rather pale, his pallor being intensified by his coal black hair and his dark eyebrows. Ellen, this is kind of you. I thank you for coming. I had intended never to enter your house again, Gray, but you said it was a matter of life and death. His voice was hard and cold. He spoke with slow deliberation. There was a look of contempt in the steady, searching gaze that he turned on Dorian. He kept his hands in the pockets of his astrakhan coat and seemed not to have noticed the gesture with which he had been greeted. Yes, it is a matter of life and death, Alan, and to more than one person. Sit down. Campbell took a chair by the table, and Dorian sat opposite to him. The two men's eyes met. In Dorian's there was infinite pity. He knew that what he was going to do was dreadful. After a strained moment of silence, he leaned across and said very quietly, but watching the effect of each word upon the face of him he had sent for, Alan, in a locked room at the top of this house, a room to which nobody but myself has access, a dead man is seated at a table. He has been dead ten hours now. Don't stir, and don't look at me like that. Who the man is, why he died, how he died, are matters that do not concern you. What you have to do is this. Stop, Gray. I don't want to know anything further. Whether what you have told me is true or not true doesn't concern me. I entirely decline to be mixed up in your life. Keep your horrible secrets to yourself. They don't interest me anymore. Ellen, they will have to interest you. This one will have to interest you. I'm awfully sorry for you, Alan, but I can't help myself. You are the one man who is able to save me. I am forced to bring you into the matter. I have no option. Alan, you are scientific. You know about chemistry and things of that kind. You have made experiments. What you have got to do is destroy the thing that is upstairs, to destroy it so that not a vestige of it will be left. Nobody saw this person come into the house. Indeed, at the present moment, he is supposed to be in Paris. He will not be missed for months. When he is missed, there must be no trace of him found here. You, Alan, must change him and everything that belongs to him into a handful of ashes that I may scatter in the air. You are mad, Dorian. Ah, I was waiting for you to call me Dorian. You are mad, I tell you. Mad to imagine that I would raise a finger to help you. Mad to make this monstrous confession. I will have nothing to do with this matter, whatever it is. Do you think I'm going to peril my reputation for you? What is it to me that what devil's work you were up to? It was suicide, Alan. I am glad of that, but who drove him to it? You, I should fancy. Do you still refuse to do this for me? Of course I refuse. I will have absolutely nothing to do with it. I don't care what shame comes on you. You deserve it all. I should not be sorry to see you disgraced, publicly disgraced. How dare you ask me, of all the men in the world, to mix myself up in this horror? I should have thought you knew more about people's characters. Your friend Lord Henry Wanton can't have taught you much about psychology, whatever else he has taught you. Nothing will induce me to stir a step to help you. You have come to the wrong man. Go to some of your friends. Don't come to me. Alan, it was murder. I killed him. Yeah, You don't know what he had made me suffer, what my life is. He had more to do with the making or the marring of it than poor Hen Harry has made. He may not have intended it. The result was the same. Murder. Good God, Dorian. Is that what you have come to? I shall not inform upon you. It is not my business. Besides, without my stirring in the matter, you are certain to be arrested. Nobody ever commits a crime without doing something stupid. But I will have nothing to do with it. You must have something to do with it. Wait. Wait a moment. Listen to me. Only listen, Alan. All I ask of you is to perform a certain scientific experiment. You go to hospitals and dead houses, and the horrors that you do there don't affect you. If in some hideous dissecting room or fetid laboratory you found this man lying on a leaden table with red gutters scooped out of it for the blood to flow through, you would simply look upon him as an admirable subject. You would not turn a hair. You would not believe that you were doing anything wrong. 
On the contrary, you would probably feel that you were benefiting the human race or increasing the sum of knowledge in the world or gratifying intellectual curiosity or something of that kind. What I want you to do is merely what you have often done before. Indeed, to destroy a body must be far less horrible than what you are accustomed to work at. And remember, it is the only piece of evidence against me. If it's discovered, I am lost, and it is sure to be discovered unless you help me. I have no desire to help you. You forget that. I am simply indifferent to the whole thing. It has nothing to do with me. Alan, I entreat you. Think of the position I am in. Just before you came, I almost fainted with terror. You may know terror yourself some day. No, don't think of that. Look at the matter purely from the scientific point of view. You don't inquire where the dead things on which you experiment come from. Don't inquire now. I have told you too much as it is, but I beg of you, do this. We were friends once, Alan. Don't speak of those days, Dorian. They are dead. The dead linger sometimes. The man upstairs will not go away. He is sitting at the table with bowed head and outstretched arms. Alan. Alan, if you don't come to my assistance, I am ruined. Why, they will hang me, Alan. Don't you understand? They will hang me for what I have done. There is no good in prolonging this scene. I absolutely refuse to do anything in the matter. It is insane of you to ask me. You refuse? Yes. I entreat you, Alan. It is useless. The same look of pity came into Dorian's eyes. Then he stretched out his hand, took a piece of paper, and wrote something on it. He read it over twice, folded it carefully, and pushed it across the table. Having done this, he got up and went over to the window. Campbell looked at him in surprise and then took up the paper and opened it. As he read it, his face became ghastly pale, and he fell back in his chair. A horrible sense of sickness came over him. He felt as if his heart was beating itself to death in some empty hollow. After two or three minutes of terrible silence, Dorian turned round and came and stood behind him, putting his hand upon his shoulder. "'I'm so sorry for you, Alan,' he murmured. "'But you leave me no alternative. I have a letter written already. Here it is. You see the address. If you don't help me, I must send it. If you don't help me, I will send it. You know what the result will be. But you are going to help me. It is impossible for you to refuse now. I tried to spare you. You will do me the justice to admit that. You were stern, harsh, and offensive. You treated me as no man has ever dared to treat me. No living man, at any rate. I bore it all. Now... It is time for me to dictate terms. Campbell buried his face in his hands, and a shudder passed through him. Yes, it is my turn to dictate terms, Alan. You know what they are. The thing is quite simple. Come. Don't work yourself into this fever. The thing has to be done. Face it and do it. A groan broke from Campbell's lips, and he shivered all over. The ticking of the clock on the mantelpiece seemed to him to be dividing time into separate atoms of agony, each of which was too terrible to be borne. He felt as if an iron ring was being slowly tightened round his forehead, as if the disgrace with which he was threatened had already come upon him. The hand upon his shoulder weighed like a hand of lead. It was intolerable. It seemed to crush him. Come, Alan, you must decide at once. I cannot do it. He said mechanically, as though the words could alter things. You must. You have no choice. Don't delay. He hesitated a moment. Is there a fire in the room upstairs? Yes, there is a gas fire with asbestos. I shall have to go home and get some things from the laboratory. No, Alan. You must not leave the house. Write out on a sheet of notepaper what you want, and my servant will take a cab and bring the things back to you. Campbell scrawled a few lines, blotted them, and addressed the envelope to his assistant. Dorian took the note up and read it carefully. Then he rang the bell and gave it to his valet, with orders to return as soon as possible and to bring the things with him. As the hall door shut, Campbell started nervously, 
and having got up from the chair, went over to the chimney piece. He was shivering with a kind of ague. For nearly twenty minutes, neither of the men spoke. A fly buzzed noisily about the room, and the ticking of the clock was like the beat of a hammer. As the chime struck one, Campbell turned round, and looking at Dorian Gray, saw that his eyes were filled with tears. There was something in the purity and refinement of that sad face that seemed to enrage him. "'You were infamous, absolutely infamous,' he muttered. "'Hush, Alan. You have saved my life,' said Dorian. "'Your life? Good heavens! What a life that is! You have gone from corruption to corruption, and now you have culminated in crime, in doing what I am going to do, what you force me to do. It is not of your life that I am thinking.' "'Oh, Alan,' muttered Dorian with a sigh. "'I wish you had a thousandth part of the pity for me that I have for you.' He turned away as he spoke and stood looking out at the garden. Campbell made no answer. After about ten minutes, a knock came to the door, and the servant entered, carrying a large mahogany chest of chemicals with a long coil of steel and a platinum wire and two rather curiously shaped iron clamps. "'Shall I leave the things here, sir?' he asked Campbell. "'Yes.' said Dorian, and I am afraid, Francis, that I have another errand for you. What is the name of the man at Richmond who supplies Selby with orchids? Hardin, sir. Yes, Hardin. You must go down to Richmond at once, see Hardin personally, and tell him to send twice as many orchids as I ordered, and to have as few white ones as possible. In fact, I don't want any white ones. It is a lovely day, Francis, and Richmond is a very pretty place. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother you about it. No trouble, sir. At what time shall I be back? Dorian looked at Campbell. "'How long will your experiment take, Alan?' he said in a calm, indifferent voice. The presence of a third person in the room seemed to give him extraordinary courage. Campbell frowned and bit his lip. "'It will take about five hours,' he answered. "'It will be time enough, then, if you are back at half-past seven, Francis. Or, say, just leave my things out for dressing. You can have the evening to yourself. I am not dining at home, so I shall not want you.' "'Thank you, sir,' said the man, leaving the room. "'Now, Alan, there is not a moment to be lost. "'How heavy this chest is. "'I'll take it for you. "'You bring the other things.' "'He spoke rapidly and in an authoritative manner. "'Campbell felt dominated by him. "'They left the room together. "'When they reached the top of the landing, "'Dorian took out the key and turned it in the lock. "'Then he stopped, and a troubled look came into his eyes. "'He shuddered. "'I don't think I can go in, Alan.' he murmured. "'It is nothing to me. I don't require you,' Campbell said coldly. Dorian half opened the door. As he did so, he saw the face of his portrait leering in the sunlight. On the floor in front of it, the torn curtain was lying. He remembered that the night before he had forgotten, for the first time in his life, to hide the fatal canvas, and was about to rush forward when he drew back with a shudder. What was that lonesome red dew that gleamed wet and glistening on one of the hands, as though the canvas had sweated blood? Oh, how horrible it was! More horrible it seemed to him for the moment than the silent thing that he knew was stretched across the table, the thing whose grotesque misshapen shadow on the spotted carpet showed him that it had not stirred, but was still there as he had left it. He heaved a deep breath, opened the door a little wider, and with half-closed eyes and averted head walked quickly in, determined that he would not look even once upon the dead man. Then, stooping down and taking up the gold and purple hanging, he flung it right over the picture. There he stopped, feeling afraid to turn round, and his eyes fixed themselves on the intricacies of the pattern before him. He heard Campbell bringing in the heavy chest and the irons and the other things that he had required for his dreadful work. He began to wonder if he and Basil Hallward had ever met, and if so, what they had thought of each other. "'Leave me now,' said a stern voice behind him. He turned and hurried out, just conscious that the dead man had been thrust back into the chair and that Campbell was gazing into the glistening yellow face. As he was going downstairs, he heard the key being turned in the lock. It was long after seven when Campbell came back into the library. He was pale, but absolutely calm. I've done what you asked me to do, he muttered, and now goodbye. Let us never see each other again. You have saved me from ruin, Alan. I cannot forget that, said Dorian simply. As soon as Campbell had left, he went upstairs. There was a horrible smell of nitric acid in the room, 
but the thing that had been sitting at the table was gone. This has been Classics You Slept Through's presentation of Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Please follow us on social media at CYSTpod. Send us an email, CYSTpod at gmail.com. And rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Stay tuned next week when we bring you our discussion episode on the section we just read.